Please grab your yellow concepts, your learning objectives, and rate yourself before the lesson. You're probably feeling pretty good about this one. It's about transformations. You've done tons of transformations in Algebra 2. So I can determine the type of transformation based on a graph or equation, vertical and horizontal translations, reflections across the x and y axes, vertical and horizontal stretches and compressions. And um, compressions is better than shrinks. We've talked about the use of vocabulary and how that helps you on an AP exam. So we are going to call those compressions. And then uh, graph a combined transformation based on the parent function. And then we've got write an equation for a combined transformation. And all of these things are probably going to take us two full days. And maybe then some. There might be some that we will have to skip as we go through here. And that's because there's quite a few of them. And we want to see all of the things that are going to take place as we work with our transformations. So types of transformations. We have what are called rigid transformations, and they leave the size and the shape of the graph unchanged. So all they do is move it. It's, it's a slide. And back in geometry, um, you found out that the names of slide and glide and shift all mean the same thing. But those would be our horizontal translations, our vertical translations, and our reflections. And reflections do that equal but opposite movement across um, whatever line it is or point it is that you're reflecting. And then we have those that distort. And those are the non-rigid transformations. So the shape, usually it's something recognizable, but it's not the same shape that you started off with. And that's horizontal stretches or compressions and vert vertical stretches and compressions. And that's uh, part of what we have to deal with today is the, the one here that you haven't dealt with before, which would be the horizontal stretches or compressions, because you've done the vertical, just not the horizontal before. So the general rule is that changes inside the function with the x are horizontal, and those are affecting the x's. And we know that anything that's inside those parentheses with the x's from experience, we have to think about that as the opposite of what we really see. And that's because the formula itself had the x minus in it. So even though it would be x minus 2, that would be a translation two units to the right instead of you know, thinking negative would be left. Everything else is pretty logical. It's just x that does the opposite movement. So changes outside the function are vertical, and those are affecting our y's. Then translations. Let C be a positive real number, then the following transformations result in translations of the graph y equals f of x. So here we see our right <clears throat> pardon me, and left shifts. And again, anything that is connected to the x via the parentheses here or absolute value bars, any grouping symbols, those are always going to be the opposite of what we see. So when we see x minus c, that's actually going to the right c units. And when we see x plus c, that's going to the left c units, and that's because x is a little stinker. It does exactly the opposite of what you always think it's going to do. However, if we have vertical translations, those are the logical ones, where if we're adding to a y value, that's going to push it up. And that's our translation up by c units. And if we're subtracting, then it's going to go down. So horizontal translations, yes, we have covered left and right shifting, left and right translations. But we haven't covered those horizontal stretches and compressions, which is part of what we're going to be talking about in this section. So example one says, when you're doing vertical translations, describe how the graph of y equals the absolute value of x can be transformed to the graph of the given equation. And I notice in A that we have y equals the absolute value of x as our parent function. So here's our parent. And what we're going to do, because that is not attached to the x, is we are going to translate down four units. And yes, use the word translate. We've talked about how the more specific your vocabulary is when you get to the AP tests, that helps you. It, it catches the attention of whoever's grading your test. Now I go to B. And now I see that I still have this parent function of y equals the absolute value of x, which is our V graph. But this time, that plus 2 is connected to my x. So I have to think anything with x responds the opposite way. So we will translate 
two units to the left. And that's because the x plus 2 came from an equation that actually had y equals a absolute value of x minus h plus k. So there was a negative 2 put in there, so that translates that two units to the left. Next up, we want to find equations for translation, so we just want to write these. And it says each view in figure 1.74 shows the graph of y sub 1, which is x to the third. So you look at all the graphs and you realize that's going to be the red dashed. So I'm just going to put my red dashes underneath that. And a vertical or horizontal translation, y sub 2. Write an equation for y sub 2 as shown in each graph. So we're supposed to figure out what kind of translation this was and then how we could represent that using that parent function of y equals x cubed. So I look at this one and I realize that the red graph went 1, 2, 3 units down. So that means I would have to take x cubed and subtract 3 from all of those y values. So that one's done. It's 3 units down and we represent that. Now we'll go to the middle one. And in the middle, I notice that I've moved one, two units to the left. So if it's going left two units, that affects the x. So my y sub 2 would have to be putting that translation inside with the x's. And again, it's always the opposite of what we think it should be. So if it's going two to the left, it's actually going to be an x plus 2. And then the last one, one, two, three units to the right. So we know we have to have that parent function of cubed, but three to the right, think opposites, because that is right and left is going to be an x movement. So that would be the quantity x minus three cubed. So there are our three translations, just basic translations, horizontal and vertical and using a parent function to show the shifting. Now, reflections. The following transformations result in reflections of the graph y equals f of x. If we want to reflect across the x-axis, this one kind of messes with people because they see, well, but the negative ends up over here, you know? But look at the notation. It's showing that we have to make a negative y, a negative f of x. So negative y and let's just say we had an x over here. If we reflect across the x-axis, we make the y negative, but in the end, we wouldn't leave it like that. You know, we've been trained over time that we would have to move that negative back over to the other side so that we have y all by itself. If for no other reason than because in graphing calculators, you always use y equals. Now, if you want to reflect across the y-axis, you have to make the x negative. So notice it's inside those parentheses with the x. If you want to reflect through the origin, it's the opposite of both, the x and the y. So up here, we see that demonstration, and you can get a feel for it. Oh, look, their x's would be opposites, but not their y's. Their y's would stay the same if we reflected over the y-axis. And then if we reflected across the x-axis, the x's stay the same, but the y's are going to change. So you could also do a quick visual when it's just a reflection across the x or the y axis to remind yourself how all of that's going to work. Now, example three says we should find an equation for reflections, and it says find an equation for the reflection of f of x equals 5x minus 9 over the quantity x squared plus 3 across each axis. So one of each. For the x-axis, we want to make the y negative, and we know that f of x is y. So that will be negative y equals 5x minus 9 over the quantity x squared plus 3. And then, at this point, we usually say, hey, let's divide everything by negative 1. But because this is a fraction, what we want to do really would be multiply both sides by negative 1. And notice, negative 1 is negative 1 over 1. 
I'm already thinking ahead of my next step here. So we would multiply the fraction by negative 1 over 1. Now the reason we only multiply either the numerator or the denominator is because if we multiplied them both, we'd be multiplying by negative 1 over negative 1, which is positive 1, and that's not what we want. So y will equal negative 5x plus 9 over x squared plus 3. Now the y-axis. So to reflect across the y-axis, what we would want to do is make the x negative. So this is going to be y equals 5 times negative x minus 9 over negative x squared plus 3. So negative 5x minus 9 over x squared plus 3. And notice how we just simplify that quantity of negative x squared. And finally, they did give this the name of f of x when we started. We might want to keep this and, and make sure we're using function notation here. I would actually take it with y. But we could call this g of x and h of x. Like I said, on the test, I, I would take those as y because they didn't give us a specific name to call it when we had that done. Now, supporting graphically, what we would want to do is take a look at the original and then our graph. So I would encourage you to pause the video at this step and punch in what the original looked like and also punch in what our answer was and make sure that visually you are seeing what we have here. All right, so next up, I talked about this a little bit uh, yesterday, and example four says we're reflecting even functions, and we want to prove that the graph of an even function remains unchanged when it's reflected across the y-axis. So one of the first things that I do is I think, all right, even functions. That means if I put a negative x in for x, I get exactly the same thing I started with. And when I talked about this yesterday in class, I was mentioning that we really do paragroup proofs in here. They're not two column proofs. And generally, the proofs that we do that are not algebraic, we will go over together in class. We don't have you do a lot of proofs on your own in paragraph form. So here's what I have to start with. I have to start with an even function. So let f be any even function. That is where we absolutely have to start. Now we have to show that that's not going to change if we reflect it across the y-axis. So if we have it as an even function, by definition, f of x equals f of negative x. Now that happens for all f in the domain. So what we're going to do is explain how people, how we, reflect across the y-axis. To reflect across the y-axis, we make the transformation trying to write too small here for this big thick marker. We make the transformation y equals f of negative x. Because if we want to reflect across the y-axis, we always make the x negative. But we said this was an even function. However, Here's what we know about even functions. f of negative x equals f of x for all x in the domain of f. Well, that means we're back to the beginning. So, This results in y equals f of x by substitution. 
And since we're right back where we started, we go back up and say, what do they want us to say? It remains unchanged. So therefore, the graph remains unchanged. So a paragraph proof is just the logic that you use to reason through describing whatever conclusion they want you to reach, which in this case is that it's unchanged when it's reflected across the y-axis. But you have to explain it. You can't just say, well, it's an even function, so that's how it works. You have to talk through it. So again, it's let f be any even function. By definition, f of x equals f of negative x for all f in the domain. To reflect across the y-axis, we make the transformation y equals f of x, f of negative x. However, because it's even, f of negative x equals f of x for all x in the domain of f. So this results in y equals f of x by substituting into those pieces. Therefore, the graph remains unchanged. So now, our next step is graphing absolute value compositions. And I want to remind you that for 16 day 2, I gave you that little worksheet, and it's in the PDFs for those of you that are doing distance learning, to kind of make this, this homework go a little faster. Otherwise, it's kind of tedious. So given the graph of y equals f of x, here's what it says. The graph of y equals the absolute value of f of x is, can be, obtained by reflecting the portion of the graph below the x-axis across the x-axis, leaving the portion above the x-axis unchanged. So here's what it's saying. We're going to make all of the y's positive, which makes sense because f of x is y. So makes all of those y's positive. Now the graph of y equals f of the absolute value of x. Now that's different because notice this is just the x's, can be obtained by replacing, replacing the portion of the graph to the left of the y-axis by a reflection of the portion to the right of the y-axis across the y-axis, leaving the portion of, to the right of the y-axis unchanged. So again, this is going to make all x's. positive. So our first big red dot up here, the absolute value bars contain f of x. So all of the y's have to stay positive. And how it says we're going to do that is we're going to move all of those across the x-axis, which would mean we're really reflecting across the x-axis anything that's below. And then the second dot explains that we have to keep all of our x's positive. So if anything is negative in our x's, well, then we have to flip it over and put it across the y-axis by a reflection so that we can take care of those absolute value bars. So the graph of y equals f of x is shown at the right. Match each of the graphs below with one of the following equations and use the language of function reflection to defend your match. Note that two of the graphs will not be used. All right. So we see that we have a parabola. And again, we know they're supposed to be arrows, but for this problem, that doesn't necessarily matter. They're going to match these up here. And number one says y equals the absolute value of f of x. So I start thinking, well, that means the y's can't be negative. And they said what we have to do is take those y's that are below the x-axis and reflect them above. So this is going to have to come up here. And now let me erase this part. So this bottom, this is going to disappear. And all of those y's have become positive. And I see, oh, look at this. Right there. That's what I'm looking for. That's C. So the next one says we want y equals f of the absolute value of x. All right? So our directions for that one was that all of the x's have to remain positive. So what's going to have to happen with this is, let's back up a second. 
It's obtained by replacing the portion of the graph to the left of the y-axis by reflecting what we had on the other side. So that means this is gone. And how we're going to get what we need is by reflecting the right side across the y-axis. Because all of our x's were positive over there, we reflect those. And I realize, well, that is A, this one right here. Now, go ahead and hit pause and try to see if you can figure out which of these should match number three and which of them should match number four. All right, for number three, we have, hey, let's take what we had with that absolute value of f of x. And the answer to that was c, so I'm going to use that. And now I'm going to have to reflect that across the x-axis. So that would look like the green. So I'm looking around to see where that is, and I notice that's f. All right, number four says, Basically, let's take what we had for an answer in number two, which was A, and now we have to find the absolute value of all of that again. And what that said was that we can't have any of those values below the x-axis. So with A, what would happen is this would be removed because it's going to be reflected up here. And that would be D. So there's a couple of these that we didn't use, and it doesn't mean that they don't have some type of transformation happening. It's, it's just that they don't have the ones that we needed. So the absolute value compositions, you always want to think back to, is it the x that's supposed to remain positive, or is it the y that's supposed to remain positive, and go from there. Now, a whole bunch of you tries. So let's see what we can get done here. Identify the parent function and the transformations in order. All right, so my parent functions, I tend to think about those 12 basic functions. That's a good way to go. And I realize that this one would be y equals x squared. So my parent is y equals x squared. Now, there are a lot of different ways to describe transformations so that they will work, but there are also some that are wrong. So, we had started off teaching with this book by talking about the order of operations and following the order of operations as you learn about these. And that works until you get to about the Algebra 2 level. And then it becomes more complicated because in pre-calculus we start talking about the horizontal. So what you're going to see in the homework is that I don't necessarily do every single one of these from left to right because here's what I want you to see. I want you to see that there are different ways to describe the transformations and still do them correctly. However, the easiest way for Algebra 2 pre-calculus students to learn is to do these from left to right. So that's what we're going to do in class. But again, if you want to see it a little bit differently and see all the transformations that would work, um, you should be looking at those worked out solutions. So if you do these left to right and you go check the homework, you might not have a perfect match. That's okay. As long as you're doing them left to right, you will always be safe. So the first number that I see that wouldn't be a part of the parent function is right here. And that's the first one that I have to describe. So that would be translate three units to the right. Because again, anything that's attached to that x in those grouping symbols is going to be the opposite of what we would normally see. And then I see a minus 5 in the back. And I put and 5 units down. Because that's the normal one. Plus is up and minus is down. It's just the x that messes with things. I go to b. And I see that our parent function would be y equals x squared. I'm going to remind you real quick of our general form, or generic form for those trans transformations. So we've got a parent of y equals x squared. And with this one, I notice, ooh, there's a negative right here. 
Now that's not attached to the X, it's not inside the parentheses. So that actually came from over here and then they divided through. So that means I have to say that it's a reflection over the X axis. So whenever you have a negative in front of the grouping symbols, that's going to be a reflection over the X axis. And then I think backwards, translate three units to the left, and there's more, and four units up. And for C, what I'd like you to do is pause the video and give that one a try. Notice that our parent function has switched here. And we can still use the H and K for our transformations, A, H, and K. So with this one, the parent is Y equals the square root of X. Again, it doesn't matter that this is a square root function. We have to think opposites about that X. So it's translated three units to the left and one unit down. And that one's done. Then we get to D, and we notice there's a problem. It's always really nice to have these in that general form, y equals a square roots of x minus h plus k. This one isn't, but we have to get it there if we want to be able to effectively describe the transformations. So the first thing we do is reverse that, and then realize, oh boy, well, that negative. I'm going to have to deal with that. So let me factor that out so I can explain what it's going to do. And my square root got a little long back there, like so. All right, so again, I have to let people know my parent is y equals the square root of x. And then I realized the reason I had to do that factoring was because there was a negative in front of the x. And a negative in front of the x is a reflection over the y-axis. And now I can go on to talk about my translations. So, so translate, translated, four units to the right, and seven units up. So we always want it in that A, H, and K form so that we can talk about our transformations from left to right. Now, this changes it up because our objectives changed this up, you know, a new chunk of information here. Write an equation for the transformation of the given parent function. So they're starting us with the parent. They're telling us what they want us to do as far as transformations go, and we need to put all of that together. So for A, it says let's take Y equals the absolute value of X, and let's move that right 6, okay? Well, that's an X movement but it's going to be x minus 6 in the formula. Then reflect that over the y-axis. Oh, well, I'll have to make the x negative. And finally, move it up 1. And that up or down movement is a k movement. And there it is. All right, for b, hit pause. Give this one a try. All right, now I recognize that this is the first time we've seen the parent function of the hyperbola here, but hopefully you're able to give this a try. Reflecting over the x-axis means we have to make the y negative, but like we've talked about so many times, we would never leave it there. So we would multiply both sides by negative 1, which is negative 1 over 1, and get negative 1 over x. Then they want us to move it down 5. Well... That's a logical movement in the back there where we would say minus 5. And again, as I'm, I'm looking at this, <clears throat> pardon me, frog issues, um, I'm thinking, did they ask me to give it a new name? Is there anything special? And they didn't, so we can just keep that Y. Again, since this is another new parent function, Please pause the video and give this one a try. In fact, why don't you give D a try as well? So C and D. 
C says, let's reflect the cubic function y equals x cubed over the x-axis. So that means making the y negative, but we wouldn't leave it there. Hopefully by now you're starting to get the hang of that. And then we need to move it to the left 2. And to the left 2 is obviously an x movement. But we remember, oh, we have to do the opposite when we do that. So there's our a, h, and k for a cubic. And then for e to the x. So with this one, kind of weird, anything with the x has to take place as part of that exponent because that's where the x is located. So for this one, it says, first, let's move this left 3. That's going to be a little x plus 3 because, again, opposite movements with the horizontal. And then we are to reflect over the y-axis. Okay, well, that's easy. That's just a negative in front of the x. So reflections, you want to reflect over the x-axis, make the y negative. Reflect over the y-axis, make the x negative. And then finally, they want us to move the whole thing down 9. And that would be a minus 9 in the back. So. This is a good place to start because we have not started talking about um, the horizontal compressions, stretches and compressions yet. So we will leave that for Monday. So for day one, go ahead and complete number one through 32. And we've covered, you know, determine the type of transformation based on a graph or equation. We talked about vertical shifts, horizontal shifts, reflections across the x and the y axis, and we talked about um, the combined transformations that we had there for the different parent functions. But we'll wait for a little bit more of this on Monday where we start dealing more with a brand new one, the horizontal stretches and compressions.